<laughs> That's emergency pr procedures. Yeah. <laughs> Should we reenact them? Yeah, he look. No smoking. No smoking. <laughs> we'll die. <laughs> Oh, we can do the exit. Say yeah. <laughs> yeah. Careful. I'm an opening overhead compartment. <laughs> Don't know what to do for this no, one. No, no, no. <laughs> Very <Really> low. <laughs> Did you just drink this water? No, because I've got it here, so I thought it was too stingy. Yeah. I have two. No, no. Then I'd have three. I have these two. Oh, yeah, you could have three of them. Mm. Fire. Fire. Bad. Yeah, don't touch it. Don't touch it. It's very hot. Oh. I've something to my neck. <laughs> Yeah. How did they choose that? Yeah. Counterintuitive password. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Not some Queen Victoria no. 2018. I want. <laughs> Safe. Did you all get the Wi Fi password? <laughs> okay. okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2018 Feminist Writers Festival. Thank you so much for being here today for this session on feminism and narrative nonfiction. We have here today Maria Tomarkin, Sarah Krasnostein, and Fatimi Mel Misham. Um, before, my, before we proceed, it is my deep privilege to acknowledge the land on which the festival is held, the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. We wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners, and we pay respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. We also pay our respects to the elders from other communities who are here with us today. Today is also National Sorry Day, a day to acknowledge the stolen generations, their families and communities for the profound grief, suffering, and loss that were visited upon them. So, welcome. Here's how today will work. I'll introduce the speakers and then hand over to the panel. At around 4.10, we'll begin, the, we'll begin question time, so please save up your questions till then. We ask that you come to the front where there are mics and so there'll be no reverb and squeaky issues, basically. On to our speakers. Sarah Krasnerstein was born in America, studied in Melbourne, and has lived and worked in both countries. Earning her doctorate in criminal law, she's a law lecturer and researcher. Her essay, The Secret Life of a Crime Scene Cleaner, was published on Long Reads and listed in Narrative Lee's Top 10 Stories for 2014. She lives in Melbourne and spends part of the year working in New York City. Lucky woman. <laughs> the Trauma Cleaner is her first book. Fatima Misham is a consulting editor and columnist at Eureka Street. She hosts the Chatter Square podcast and tweets as at Fumeister. And finally, our panel, um, our panel coordinator, the panel herder, the person running the show, really. <laughs> director. <laughs> panel director. director. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> panel director, Maria Tamarkin, writes books, Video. reviews, essays, and pieces for performance and radio. She collaborates with visual artists, psychologists, and historians. Her work has been published, performed, carved into dog set titles, and set to music. Maria teaches creative writing at the University of Melbourne, and her latest book is Axiomatic. Over to you, Maria. Please make our speakers welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Let's check our microphones. Is it working? Can you hear us? Hello. Yeah? Um, okay, and One, feel two. free during the session, just, you know, if any of the speakers, you know, you can just always say that. Um, <laughs> 
Um, so um, thank you very much, Fun Ling. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. So I am, uh, as well as being the director uh, of this uh, session, I am participating chair, so I will also be uh, part of the discussion, and we're hoping to have a really kind of democratic conversation, a little bit wild, a little bit anarchic, you know, uh, unscripted, completely unrehearsed, so we don't know what to expect uh, from each other, and that's what excites us. Um, what we decided to do, because this session is so kind of constructed in such an, an inspired way, where we actually have almost an hour for a conversation with you, uh, which is fantastic, and we don't get to do that kind of stuff at sort of your standard festivals uh, and events. So we thought that we really did have a little bit of time at the start that we could take uh, talking a little bit about our work as it connects to the question of nonfiction and writing about women's lived experiences and the larger forces that structure women's lives, uh, and do short reading. Okay, so Fatima is going to go first, then Sarah, then me, uh, and then we're going to open up a conversation. All right. Yep. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. So I'm Fatima. I'm consulting editor and columnist at Eureka Street, um, which is an online publication that um, runs commentary on politics, social affairs, um, the environment, um, stuff like that. Um, so our lens is always about what matters. So usually that boils down to um, things like human dignity and rights. Um, so that's pretty much my alley. Um, so the columnist Fortnightly also produce um, Chatter Square, which is an extension of Eureka Street in a way. Yeah, we, we try to be cute with that. <laughs> Eureka Street, you know, you turn left, you get to Chatter Square. So, um, so it's meant to be like this, um, a public space for diving deep into questions of, of change. Um, so obviously, that's quite a broad um, sphere, and, and you know, it gives me a chance to speak to really interesting people. So those are my main um, gigs. As part of the role, I actually also commission um, writers. Um, so I tap people on the shoulder if I think that they have something to say and that they should say it. Um, and it's probably the bit of my job that I love the most. Like, I just love it. I love it. I love it so much. Anyway. Um, <laughs> it's just, yeah, so because I, I know what it's like to sort of come from nowhere uh, and have someone notice me. So, like, I, I, feel, I feel like since I'm able to do that to a limited degree, that that's, that's uh, something that I really like to spend time on. So my own interests um, obviously intersect with my writing. So it's usually around questions of identity, um, questions of justice, um, freedom, um, things like that. So these, these things tend to overlap and get politicized and weaponized. So I try to unpack that both <coughs> from a personal observational point of view, but also in terms of you know, the larger kind of sphere. So I think it might be worth mentioning that I'm Catholic, so I come from that um, condition, uh, conditioning as well, but it's a particular streak of Catholicism that's quite liberal, liberal progressive. So I went to a Jesuit university, and I'm not sure if you know anything about the Jesuits, but they're, you know, sure. rabble rousers. Yeah. So I mean, in, I'm with the right crowd. Um, so I think now might be a good time mm -hmm. just to read a little bit from an essay that I wrote for Mianjin. Do you want to print out? I've got it. Oh, you're so wonderful. <laughs> She's so organized. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, so it's called I, Citizen. It was published in 2016. I can't recall with certainty how these things unfold, but the evening I became an Australian, there was an enormous portrait of Queen Elizabeth II at the front. The mayor was in full velvet regalia, and there were mini flags. They played a shiny video that was a hybrid of tourist patriotic propaganda. We made the pledge. We sang the national anthem. I sang it with gusto, perhaps even defiantly. I received a certificate that carried Chris Bowen's signature. I signed onto the electoral roll, ceding the luxury of being able to say, that's not my prime minister. <laughs> we were given a native plant as some kind of token. I thought it was very sweet, but also alarming. Is it supposed to stand for something? What if this shrub failed to thrive under my care? What would that portend? Would I get away with replacing it? I planted it in our courtyard in the middle of a drought and hoped for the best. It had taken six years for me to get to that ceremony, long after I became eligible to apply for citizenship. I had moved to Melbourne in my early 20s. 
that per period when we make the mistake of thinking we know who we are. It turns out that much of our sense of reality is attached to particular places, histories, and relationships. There were times when I would wake, forgetting that I had moved. The outlines of my bedroom made strange in early morning shadow. It was as if in those first few seconds of consciousness, another life asserted itself, the one before. Green came in different shades, eucalypts pale against the tropical hues of memory. The heat was arid rather than humid. I would walk down suburban streets wondering where all the people were. It took a while for me to get used to the vast empty spaces that flanked the freeway. Uh, I think it's double-sided. Oh, there we go. That would make sense. <laughs> But there were other disorientations. In my first year in Australia, a Pakistani refugee lit himself on fire in Canberra after his application for a family reunion was rejected. A Norwegian freighter that had rescued hundreds of Afghans in international waters was not allowed to dock. In a separate incident, politicians declared that children had been thrown into the sea. It was also the year when two planes slammed into the World Trade Center in New York. On an inner city street in Melbourne, a scarf was ripped off a woman's head. A few years later, violence erupted on a sun-drenched beach in Cronulla. I am not Muslim, but the skin I am in is brown. I have an Arabic name. I absorb the stories of people being abused on trams and trains, people who look Indian or Chinese or African. I heard the way people with microphones talked about us. At Melbourne Central, in a room designated for parents with young children, a woman hurled, hurled the words, bloody foreign mongrels. I was glad that my baby was not yet verbal. It does not take long for migrants in Australia to realize that no certificate of citizenship will protect them from anyone who believes that they belong elsewhere. I'll always be someone who arrived, ever arriving. I had left. I might finish. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Um, I'm Sarah Krasnstein. I wear two hats uh, professionally. In my legal work is um, criminal procedural law generally, which very few people find as exciting, uh, and <laughs> sentencing specifically, which many people do find exciting. Um, and so I teach in those areas, and I do consulting research in those areas. Um, and then my uh, writing at the moment is, most of that time is on creative nonfiction, which hopefully is very exciting, that's why we're all today. Um, although it's a term, well, narrative nonfiction or creative nonfiction, it was really, I think it was Philip Lope or Lee Gutkin or someone who writes about the craft of it, saying that to call it creative nonfiction is to, it, is to dare people to read it because it sounds so boring. Really? <laughs> it's like, really, I think it sounds quite interesting. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, so the stories that I'm interested in researching and in telling um, are, I guess they have certain parallels with uh, the stories that kind of are at the heart of any sentencing judgment. Um, you know, I, I like working in a longer format. I like working over a number of years, like, you know, the dust to accrue on the research, because I like to look for longitudinal change over time, because at the end of the day, while those are two very different fields, they're ultimately concerned with context, um, questions of, you know, culpability and redemption and character and, you know, human discernment, human judgment. So I think that's not something that those aren't decisions or conclusions that can be made quickly. Um, and so I really have, I take a lot of joy in, in the research process. Um, and my book, my only book so far, is The Trauma Cleaner. And this took four years from beginning to end. And it's, for those of you who haven't read it, about the life and work of a Melbourne woman named Sandra Pankhurst, who is a trauma cleaner. Um, and I was initially very interested in that job because you know, I consider myself a relatively well-informed member of our community and I had no idea that this profession existed, but you give it two seconds of thought and obviously it has to because you know the cops or you know emergency services are often doing their thing. They're not staying behind to make sure that the rest of us don't see the blood on the sidewalk in the morning, so somebody has to step in and do it. 
But um, you know, very early on, after I sat down with Sandra, I realized that you know, this work is actually the, the least interesting part of her life. Uh, and so the book took off from there. And I'm going to read a passage from it, which is, so the book alternate, alternates biographical chapters about Sandra's life with kind of present day reportage um, in which I observe her at work. And part of that was, you know, sitting down with a number of her clients who, you know, people would know as hoarders or people who live in domestic squalor and never leave their house, but, you know, they would open up their homes and want to sit down and tell me how, how they had gotten to that point. So the book is very much about their stories as well. And this is, uh, this passage is about a woman named Janice who um, is a hoarder. Uh, her only bathroom had, the toilet had broken down eight years before Sandra was called in to do this clean and was never repaired. And she basically lives in this kind of damp uh, darkness where the black mold uh, was discovered, you know, a couple of hours into the clean to have been so bad that, we, you know, the house was no longer habitable. But um, at the time that I was making these observations, we didn't know that. So, uh, as a person, Janice is, of course, more than her house. But it is also true that her house is an indicator of what it feels like to be Janice. And what it feels like to be Janice is to be asphyxiating slowly and helplessly under the crushing and ever multiplying weight of the past and the present. I picture her here on this couch, curled into herself like a fern at 4 AM. And though it must feel like a catacomb in that dark hour, and though every hour behind these blinds has been dark, the house is spinning with movement. Mold is traveling up and down the walls. Food is rotting. Cans are rusting. Water is dripping. Insects are being born, and they are living and dying. Janice's hair is growing. Her heart is beating. She is breathing, which is to say that this, too, is life. Like the creatures that swim in the perfect blackness of the ocean floor, the ecosystem here would be unrecognizable to most people, but this, too, is our world. The order of things includes those who are excluded. There is a drumbeat of light thuds from the bathroom where Lizzie is throwing numerous empty shampoo bottles into her rubbish bag. As Sandra makes her way around the living room, Janice talks about how it wasn't like this when she first moved here. It was quite nice. Sandra motions towards the dark bathroom where wet clothes are splayed on the floor and floating in a bathtub amid centipedes. Those clothes have got to go, doll, she says resignedly. No, Janice says. They've been in sewage, love. Stay focused, Sandra coaches. <laughs> Janice grabs a bag out of Sandra's hands. This is obviously rubbish, Sandra sighs. I know that, Janice says, and emits a high giggle. Then why are you going through it, Sandra asks calmly, pointing to an e empty food tin that Janice has extricated from the bag. I'm worried that something good may be mixed up in something bad. I mean, you know, there's not a million dollars here, I suppose. Mm. The mold creeps up the walls. It rests in ashy black piles on and under everything. It streaks Janice's top and her face and her hands, which she thrusts again and again into the rubbish bags, desperately clawing out each item, sorting through everything for something valuable to save, because she believes, if not in the absolute value of every item under her roof, in the possibility, at least, that something infinitely <coughs> precious may be left forgotten in the curl of a cat food can or in the folds of an old newspaper, which to discard irretrievably would be to experience a small death. Nothing good there, she calls out to Lizzie and Cheryl working in the kitchen. No, nothing, comes the answer amid the clank of cutlery and dishes. Oh, Janice says softly. You've got to relax a bit, Sandra soothes. You're being too hard on yourself. In a dream I sometimes have, I am frantically trying to save as much as I can from my childhood home before I am forced to leave forever because of some disaster. In this dream from which I awake with my jaw clenched like a fist, I grab whatever I can reach, take whatever I can carry. Always my childhood books and our family photo albums, but sometimes also the silver candlesticks, the things on my father's desk, the paintings on the walls. Maybe it comes from the speed with which my family changed shape one day. Maybe it comes from moving. Maybe it comes from my grandmother's hinted horror of losing everything in the Holocaust. But I cannot part with the dented pot that I, once re that I remember my mother putting on the stove each week, or the sofa or the sofa my father bought with his first paycheck, which was never comfortable when I was growing up and is not comfortable now. <laughs> Cannot part with the lipstick I found rolling softly in an empty drawer after my mother left, or a shopping list on an envelope in her handwriting. In a world that changes so quickly and where everyone eventually leaves, our stuff is the one thing we can trust. 
It testifies through the mute medium of things that we were a part of something greater than ourselves. Janice's house is more than a question of homey clutter, of tiny shelves and the things we place there, but pain is a sacred puzzle where any piece, however misshapen, fits seamlessly. In the context of facing her fears alone, Janice's fortress of shit makes sense. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I'll just say a couple of kind of more general <laughs> things and then just say something about um, my book as well. And I guess what I want to say, um, and that's, I suppose, part of the conversation uh, here today, is that we are all familiar, overly familiar perhaps, with that powerful toxic tradition of denigrating um, a great deal of women writing not only about uh, their lived experiences, but from and through and with their lives as somehow inferior forms of literary production, as somehow inferior forms of thinking, analysis, and synthesis. So Helen Garner was just publishing her diaries. Rachel Kask was just working through her private resentments, her poor family. And sometimes I think that we are over this crap by now, and sometimes I think the opposite. Um, and I see it a lot uh, in my students. I teach at the University of Melbourne in the creative writing department, uh, particularly young women of color, um, how they feel often at the start of their masters and PhDs that putting what they know about what it's like to be them, to be born into their families and webs of connections and into their silences and into their bodies, to put that kind of knowledge, to put that uh, at the center of their work is somehow narcissistic and self-indulgent and uh, anti-intellectual, insular, even defensive, something that they, with their formidable intellects and their considerable uh, creative writing gifts, are meant to transcend and leave behind in the projects that they undertake. And then I see uh, many of them beginning to recognize that the hard distinction between experience and structural analysis, between writing inside out from the inside of your bodies and your knowledges and everything that you've witnessed and everything that sits inside of you as the intergenerational memory or knowledge and meaningful critique, that that kind of hard distinction uh, is actually bogus, that the experiences, uh, in fact, are sites in which power relations and histories and hauntings and entrapments and resistances reveal themselves, that experiences are, in fact, forms of thinking and knowing deeply the world around you, and that particular minorities in particular are made to feel that their experiences are minor, that their subjectivities are minor, that they are not enough, never enough. And I'm not just reiterating for the trillionth time that the personal is political. I'm saying I hope something a little bit more specific, that the personal in nonfiction in particular is always bearing witness to something that is much larger than personal, that in certain kinds of nonfiction, the kind of stuff that we like to write and read and give ourselves to, um, this, the, the personal and much infinitely larger than personal always travel together. So that's kind of a general sort of thought. Um, um, just in relation to this book, there are um, five main women uh, in this book. And I'm just going to read um, um, a passage. In fact, I'm going to kind of jump around like crazy um, between like three or four pages uh, about a woman who, uh, whose name is Vera Vasovsky. Um, she um, is a child Holocaust survivor. Um, she was born in Poland. Um, she was one of the um, tiny little um, um, pr proportion, if that's the word, um, of uh, Jewish Polish children to survive at the end of the Second uh, World War. And like all of them, um, she survived in hiding. Uh, she is uh, not uh, someone um, we kind of, um, or she doesn't appear to be like a kind of a survivor that we, a particularly Holocaust survivor that we expect to see, a kind of a, a, a sage, a witness, someone who is kind of endlessly testifying and uh, someone who's in, uh, constantly and endlessly reminding us that we must remember history so as not to repeat it. Uh, she's a very, very kind of different person and I'm deeply excited uh, by women who exceed the parameters and shapes uh, that they seem to be assigned uh, by virtue of their experiences. So just a little bit of jumping around, just, um, and I guess I'm, I'm trying to sort of read from a passage that goes from her into a, a more general discussion of something that I'm really interested in. Um, so this is not a start, but uh, bear with me. 
I'm writing about Vera, and Anglo people say Vera, but I say Vera. Um, I'm writing about Vera because she's unlike all the other child Holocaust survivors I've met or read about. She drinks, smokes, parties, drops names. She's in her 80s and she can outdance and outdrink most people out there. And I say this from experience and other people, my friends also are part of this social experiment to see if we can ever outdrink her. And, um, <laughs> and uh, we have all failed. Um, she, she's prickly, she's had lots of men. The world people routinely use for her is outrageous. Other survivors tend to keep their distance from Vera. Um, most people, Vera said to me one day, don't know who I am, and I'm not going to start telling them who I am because I can't be bothered. So there you are. There you are is Vera's way of ending stories, as well as that's how it goes, as well as that was the end of the story. <laughs> you think the wheels are beginning to turn on a story she's telling, then you hear the screeching, so there you are. It's not obfuscation, and it's not like those stories can squash her, can undo her, She's able to handle them now, and probably this should give you a measure of her, always could. It's something else, the simultaneous brutal pull of two forces, perhaps. If a narrative of our life is something we weaved during the day and unravel at night, uh, loosening the woven cloths of the day in nocturnal trick, as Ovid wrote about Homer's Penelope, then there is in Vera, in the Vera I know, the urge towards the narrative and the urge away from it. Hang on a second, and I'll get to the final bit that I want to read to you, which connects to that. Okay. We soft-fleshed denizens of the West have come to rely on a certain image of a Holocaust survivor. And actually, the point I'm making is about a survivor in general, much, much more than a particular kind of a survivor. So we can think about the Royal Commission and the kind of cultural work that um, exhausting and cultural work that we're expecting survivors to do through kind of endless testimony. Okay, so we soft flesh denizens of the West have come to rely on a certain image of a Holocaust survivor and other kinds of survivor too, taken over by their moral and emotional compulsion to testify, lest the world forgets. Sometimes like Prima Levi, Borowski, Frankel, or the non-Jewish Delbo, immediately after the war, more later, once the world has plucked the cherry stones out of its ears and begun less listening. But a just as powerful compulsion inside survivors steers towards silence. Survival leaves you knowing both testimony and silence as tainted choices, each riddled equally with despair. You must speak because how else will what happened to you and your people be known as the monstrosity it was, as the end of the world that it is? How else to turn it to anathema, make it an impossibility in the future? You see how unthinkably fast the world's memory is fading here more and more. No, it didn't happen that way. You must speak because the act of speaking, the narrative you make and remake with each telling, is what will keep you alive, what you will hang on to because this narrative covers incompletely, too bad, the hole inside you. You must speak because if you don't, they win. If you don't, you have stopped fighting, given up. You must not speak because it's with only a few fellow survivors that these conversations are properly possible. The telling and the listening do not feel so piercingly unreal. As if it is about someone else, you must not speak because what you know is impossible to bring into language. It is beyond transmitting. And whatever you can say is only a tiny bit of it. And by saying it and letting them think it's the whole thing, you're betraying the memory of those who cannot speak or be silent for themselves. You must not speak because this speaking exhausts you, empties you out. The burden of remembering and testifying is too much. The tyranny of narrative, too much. You do not wish to go back there again and again, and for what? You must not speak because your life is much bigger than this. You've made it so, beaten the odds. You must not speak because you have done more than enough speaking. So I'll just end it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, I was going to uh, start with Sarah um, and just go back to the passage that Sarah read about Janice. And I read somewhere that you went to 20 trauma cleaning jobs uh, with Sandra. Um, and some of them are the aftermath of a crime or of a suicide. And some of them are to do with people who uh, live like Janice in kind of, uh, what did you call it, the wet 
damp the darkness. Wet, yes, yes. Or, wet or some, squalor, dry or wet, squalor. Yeah, wet squalor and dry squalor. Um, so I'm interested whether you, at least initially, went with Sandra to those different jobs as a way of understanding Sandra better and understanding what she does and how she does it. Uh, and then perhaps by being there, um, you decided to include the experiences of women like Janice, or perhaps that was your intention as well, that you were at the outset deeply interested in, in those people that Sandra would come up against uh, in those jobs. Because the reason why I'm asking is because writing about Sandra, Sandra is such a kind of amazing person, and I will never use the word character. She's not a character. She's a person, right? She's this absolutely amazing person. She's, she's epic. She's endlessly compelling. But Janice is a, and you spend four years, right, uh, kind of hanging around her. And, uh, but Janice is a kind of very, very difficult, perhaps, I imagine, to write about how, you know, and people like that are kind of represented as grotesque. Yes. So, yeah, don't touch your microphone. As the director of this yeah. panel, I will <laughs> have to issue a warning to you, Sarah. Right? Technology, um, <laughs> biotech. Um, so was it part of your kind of overall vision uh, and how did you kind of negotiate this, this decision to, to make space for women like Janice in this book? Um, so, yeah, that, that, um, those chapters, the, you know, uh, bring your writer to work day chapters, <laughs> that happened very organically. That was right. not my intention right. um, at the beginning. Um, but, it, you know, it unfolded over time and there were, because of the sensitivity of the work, there were certain jobs that I just couldn't go on. Um, but for those that I could, you know, in the, in the first couple of months of getting the story, um, and that's pretty much where I got most of the story um, earlier on in the process, um, you know, it, it unfolded and it was, it was not yet routine. And the, I hadn't set out to write about those clients, the living clients and also the, the dead ones. Um, my interest for the longest time was not in, in them specifically, but in what I was seeing, which was, um, you know, I had spent so much time getting Sandra's story and so much time kind of trying to piece together this personal uh, history, historical narrative. And so watching her in the present doing her thing, I was actually seeing all of those layers in action. Mm -hmm. These beautiful echoes and correspondences between what Sandra had lived through and how she was using them, using that experience or, or not in her present day life. And so I thought that if I could include those chapters, that was an additional layer for the readers to kind of see the long-term consequences, both positive and negative, of you know, the life that she had lived and the impact mm -hmm. on her. Um, and then over time, there were enough, you know, wonderful experiences in these deeply dark spaces. Um, and I don't say wonderful in a happy, positive way, but like in a deeply human sense that I wanted to capture initially because the people wanted to sit down with me and explain to me how they got to that point. Um, and uh, so they knew you were writing a book. Yeah, always. And I would always. say, you know, and they have enough. It, they were, you know, not, not, you know, like you said, I went on many more jobs and made it into the book. Mm -hmm. So where there was somebody that was keen enough to kind of give me that background, mm -hmm. like how do you do justice to that? How do you, um, and then that's its own story. So, you know, as a matter of craft, it was difficult, but I think it was beneficial. Um, but yeah, not a deliberately, mm -hmm. you know. And were you able, beginning. because I'm, I'm struck by, um, you're right, and the passage that you read is so intensely poetic, and it's, but it's also like you are there in the shit, you are in the dirt, you're like, we can smell it, and you know, and spare thought for Sarah, who actually had a small child, uh, as she went uh, on all those jobs as well. Um, so, but, but there is a, a way that you're seeing Janice Yes. where she's not, she's never caricature, she's never grotesque, and she's never just this kind of broken person who we can feel empathy towards, but she's kind of defined by the brokenness. Mm -hmm. You are, and I, and I wondered whether it was actually Sandra who allowed you to see Janice and other people like that to, to, to some extent. So there is no condescension, and there is no kind of sense in which Janice is just, 
as, and as you say, Janice is more than her house, and, and then you kind of go into the kind of microcosm of her house, and yet you write about her in a way that is never ever kind of soaked in pity, uh, never ever condescending. Uh, it's never poor Janice. I mean, we feel things, but in a different way. Well, I'm glad that that uh, is how it comes across, because you don't know when you're, you try mm. to do something. And, um, it was um, more a function, you know, Sandra's there, she's doing the job, she's, you know, has this wonderful integrity of being the same in every situation, and that kind of, in that sense, she's a wonderful Virgil, because he would really follow her anywhere. Mm. To the dark and it's just mm. bitching about the traffic and the weather and wondering what she's having for lunch and all the, the rest of it. So that has a normalizing effect. But then she gets on with her job and you know her strength and also her weakness is that she has this kind of um, deep interiority, almost solipsistic at times. And so the people are just still clients and I guess they have to be mm. in order to do that work. So it was more the patterns over time and the the themes that these people were sharing with me, and they were predominantly women. They were predominantly women in their 60s who had had um, a very successful careers, who were very interested in the world. Most of them were readers, and it was deeply confronting for me to work, walk into these spaces, which were, you know, on their surface, so deeply, you know, extraterrestrial or gross or weird, and actually find that there was nothing strange there. There was just human pain in there, but for the rest of the grace of whatever you want to call it, go the rest of us, and by that I mean myself. And so it's like, well, what is the difference between them and me? And there was no difference. It was only difference. It was only a life that had kind of been disrupted by something and without the security of a safety net and how how does this save us or how does you know this kill us? Mm. And so it was very much their voices that did that work for the way that I came to see, mm. to see them over time. And in the passage that you read to us, you are, it's one of those rare mo moments in the book where you tell us about your life. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're very present in the book, but in a different way. And this is a kind of, maybe there are two other moments of a certain human nakedness. So I'm interested in how you thought through the question of how much of yourself, what kind of, <laughs> what uh, to put in, where to put in. Because it's, it's, it's a big question and there is, there's a great deal of thought, I, I feel, in, in the way that you come in in those rare moments but in a very kind of powerful way. And then you get out of the way of Sandra yeah. as well, well. So you, you, don't, you don't hog anything. Um, yes, well, thank you. That's lovely. Some people think that I do. Uh, well, they understand I nothing. Win, but you, thank you. Thank no. you. See, this is the, well. I didn't want to do it, um, but I, it was a decision that I made very early on, and you can see it if you read the early essay version of um, what turned into the book. Um, and it was for a couple of reasons. It was immediately um, clear that Sandra was an unreliable narrator because of her large tracts of memory loss, and so. Um, as a matter of craft, how do you kind of get from the beginning to the end of a book on a narrative arc with somebody that cannot remember vital, you know, chronological connections and also where the historical record runs dry because this is not a public figure. This is somebody who has left a very light trace on, on the public record. So, you know, in terms of a, get very wanky about it, but like a, a, an ethos, like an artistic proof, um, I can insert myself as a credi hopefully, credibly, credible narrative voice, um, and that can run like a railing or banister um, through the, bo the book, and I can take my reader along with me. And you might not like me, and you might not agree with me, but at least you'll see how, um, you know, at least I can provide consistency in that regard, and you can see the filter through which all the information is going. Like, then, I think ethically, what I was asking Sandra to do and what I was asking of the clients was, you know, you know this point I make at the, at the end about, you know, how do we form connections by being terrified to tell our stories and doing it anyway, and then, you know, getting an empath empathetic response from, you know, the, the, the listener. So if I was asking that of them, then I had to probably do it myself. So mm -hmm. it was deeply uncomfortable for me. It never gets uh, more comfortable. But that's also why I choose the passage, because I feel called to do that as well, mm -hmm. um, kind of as a social contract, or again, wanky, the energy of it. But it is, it, it, it is very much mm -hmm. an important part of it. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And just continuing with this idea of the kind of the personal and much larger than personal. Um, Fatima, the passage you read, kind of, you stay with your experiences, but then it just goes far beyond, you know, for those people. And, and this essay is available online, and I would urge you to read it if you haven't read it uh, before. It's called I Citizen. And then you really, so you kind of give us this uh, very, very visceral, interesting, witty uh, um, kind of entry point into your experiences of citizenship and this moment when you say, I've given up the right to say it's not my prime minister, it's not my country, I've, I, I love that moment. Uh, but then you go into like a really far-ranging kind of discussion of uh, citizenship, uh, mm -hmm. and you bring a really kind of very strong historical consciousness, you, you bring very strong political consciousness as well. So I'm kind of interested in how you think through the relationship between the personal uh, and the kind of, you know, larger than personal, mm. uh, perhaps critique or analysis or interrogation, you know, we can, we can call it all sorts of things. Yeah. And, and perhaps you can also reflect on that as a, you say you love, 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 love commissioning. <laughs> uh, so also in terms of how you commission, how you write and how you commission, how you think through that relationship. Yeah. Um, first I want to start by saying if you haven't picked it up yet, um, grab Sarah's book and Peter's Peter. book. Um, <laughs> it's amazing, really. Um, but to go to your question, um, I think particularly with this essay, um, I think my being here, my experience of being here was just so antagonistic. Like there was something, there was something, there was quite a bit of hostility attached to my being here, I felt. Mm -hmm. So I arrived in late December 2000. And then in 2001, the Tampa happened and 9-11 happened, all that sort of stuff. So my first year in Australia was really tangled with a lot of rhetoric and, and all this junk that gets thrown up um, periodically. And I found myself, and you know, when you move to another country, it's, how, it, this, it's, um, it's discombul discombobulating. You know, there's, it's, really, it's really disorienting. Um, you know, because the people um, that, have these pieces of you that have this picture of who you are. They're kind of over there. <laughs> and so when you move to another country, you kind of sort of, ugh, you know, I don't have the same pieces anymore. I don't, it's, it really is actually quite disorienting. So, so I moved to another country and all these pieces of, of my identity that I thought fit were suddenly like misplaced or re replaced. Yeah. So I was already feeling that. And then to come into an antagonistic, hostile, sort of culture, like I had to interrogate it. I had to decide which bits to own and which bits to like put aside as not being truthful. And so it revolved around the idea of citizenship because in this country, it's like, it's like the thing that gets weaponized. Mm. I can tell you, I've been really, really delighted at how many MPs and senators we've <laughs> <laughs> lost because of section 44, I'm just, <laughs> oh man. The schadenfreude is, just, <laughs> is very, just exquisite. Um, so I had, so yes, yeah, so it, it was a process of, of self-interrogation and, and in order to sort of um, pull apart this thing, I did go into the politicization of it. I did go into historically what did being a citizen even mean. And I suppose in a way it was, it was about coming around and trying to find a way to, to grapple um, you know, with, with this thing in a way that made sense to me. Because if, if you don't, so I'm kind of trying to reach for a thing that makes sense. Um, I, I, think, I think with identity, you know, unless you make choices or decisions around um, you know, who you are or what, you, what your sense is of who you want to be, you kind of, unless you do that, you end up ceding control to people who have all sorts of opinion about, about who you are and what you ought to be and what you will never be. I think that's the main thing. Um, so yeah, I think that, that's kind of sort of the rough terrain of, of what the essay was. And, and I don't know that someone who had grown up here all their life would have been able to, to traverse that same terrain. It just would be a different experience. So that, that, that essay was really, really grounded in, in a very sort of internal journey, really, that kind of ended up on the page. Um, so look, I'm not sure how to segue into the commissioning bit. but, but Just do it. <laughs> um, you know, 
know, it's just, and, and it's really hard to say these things without um, saying them in, in, a, in a different way, or in a fresh new way. But um, it takes a certain kind of context, and it takes a certain kind of person from a particular context to notice things. And so it's really, really important for me, um, um, as one of the people who commissions articles at Eureka Street, that we, we, we find those people who notice things that we might not be noticing. That sounds like really, makes us look really good, but um, it makes us better in the end. I mean, there's a self-interest there. Like our readership has gone up and it expanded. Because um, it used to be, um, so our audience used to be mostly, you know, because Eureka Street started 25 years ago and was published by Just Communications. So, you know, it captured, it captured a, a Catholic, you know, uh, readership of a certain age, which are now in their 60s, 70s, 80s. And so that was the, that was the, the you know, that was the core. But, you know, surprise, surprise, when you bring in women um, writers, when you bring in women of, uh, women of color to, to write, you know, these perspectives come to the fore and your audiences come along. Um, so it's really, I, th I think it's, it's critical. Um, you know, and I, and I would, you know, I would acknowledge that the editor I work with, like Tim Kernett, who's a white dude, as white as they come. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tim, wherever you are. Um, I th and he, he acknowledged that. Like, we both really, really felt that it was time to really shake things up. That it wasn't, we weren't, it wasn't, you know, it, we didn't see a future. We didn't see, sorry, we didn't see a future for Eureka Street that didn't involve breaking it apart, mm -hmm. so it could be shared. Um, you know, so he, you know, specifically said, "I really need you to just go out there and tap people on the shoulder." Mm -hmm. um, and so I've really run with it, and I've enjoyed it, and I think that it's brought, um, you know, perspectives that you know are that you don't normally see in the mainstream. You know, sometimes, sometimes we publish things knowing it won't get the clicks, but it's some, it's an ins, it carries an insight yep. that deserves a platform. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that kind of sort of goes to like the, the, the writing that you do, kind of sort of excavating mm -hmm. in, in, in finding those, those deeper resources to get the full spectrum of humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, because at the end of the day, I think writers reach for the truth, you know, and you can't, the full picture, unless you got all the pictures. I'm, I'm kind of sort of <laughs> coming through these, but 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 yeah, you, you get what I'm saying, right? Like, um, I, I think I think that um, we we deserve it. We owe it to ourselves. We we owe the truth mm -hmm. to ourselves, and that involves you know seeing the whole picture and whether you know, sometimes that's uncomfortable, like literally, <laughs> physically uncomfortable, or whether it's emotionally taxing. I think it's something that we owe ourselves. And in the green room, you said something really beautiful, Fatima, about how to you writing, and correct me, and kind of edit it, uh, is often an act of reclamation. I wonder if you could talk a tiny little bit, and you've already kind of mentioned excavation as one of the kind yeah. of most pressing tasks, uh, and, and that search for context. And the yeah, search for that's truth. right. Yep. So what about kind of, you know, to write is to reclaim that kind of impulse? Yes, um, and once again, this, this comes from like my conditioning and who I am and where I'm from. Like, for example, I wrote an essay about Filipino women, you know, because all these stereotypes, mm -hmm. About their you know, Filipino women are, are cardboard cutouts, really, I discovered very quickly. And I had to go home, actually, that's not, that's not the complete thing. Like, women were warriors and prophets, and Filipino women were, were warriors and prophets and poets, and, you know, so, so it was really important for me to kind of disrupt um, or interrupt, you know, these ideas. I'm from, um, I actually live in Windham Vale, but I'm from the Werribee district as well. So that was another thing that I felt a really, that really, a lot of my writing is really because I get like tetchy about something. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and I didn't, yeah, and, and so it's, it's, a lot of it is just basically, um, yeah, reclaiming, interrupting, disrupting. Um, you know, do you find that that's, that, was that, is that how you come into your writing? Like, kind of sort of going sideways at something, isn't it? Like, um, 
I, I think I often write out of anger. Um, okay. I think it's really useful. I, I don't think it's a kind of bad energy to, sorry, <laughs> when I say the word energy, because they oh, no, no, have no. like a funny, uh, you know, <laughs> if it's a funny moment uh, in the book, I think you say something. If I can say the word without hating myself, you know. Uh, anyway, so you've just yeah. ruined that word uh, for me forever. <laughs> um, but um, so often about like, you know, also just being kind of, you know, what the hell is going on? Yeah. I, I think, you know, just being astounded by things that are happening um, uh, around us, and what you said about noticing, it's about also just uh, a lot of a lot of the kind of uh, interesting stuff for me comes from just noticing something seemingly small, but just it stays with me and eats at me, and then I kind of need to go back and 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 think about it. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of kind of reclamation, more I, I feel for me maybe it's not reclamation um, as such, but it's about. Um, I think we get comfortable with the way we talk about things that I was going to ask Sarah, and hopefully we'll, do we have time? Like how, we're, we're good, we're good. Um, so I'll, I'll ask Sarah about trauma. You know, I, I just, uh, we get very comfortable with the way we, certain, we use certain kinds of ideas and concepts. Um, and so one of my impulses is always to kind of just push harder yeah. and kind of think harder. So maybe it's one of the things that kind of is there in a lot of the work yeah. that I do. What about, what about you, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I think that like the frustrating thing uh, as a general observation compared to more like, you know, my own more cl clinically academic work is the creative work really doesn't lend itself to this kind you know, doing all the research on the topic that was interesting to you or form the impetus for you to have the emotions to then go deeper. You do all that work and then, um, you know, there's no, uh, it clicks and you write it up. It remains, that act of drafting remains the thinking process, but before it can even get there, it's the feeling process. So you're working through what you feel about it. You know that you care enough about this topic to get angry or to get sad or be curious or whatever. Like for me, it feels like you know, this, it literally, it almost feels physical. Like there's a guitar string that has been mm. plucked in my stomach mm. and I know something's there. And sometimes that's deeply annoying because you don't want to necessarily devote your life to something that is disturbing. Um, and so, you know, when you compare it to something shorter that you can just do the thinking, do the research, write it up, and it's gone from your life, you're committing to a process of feeling through something before you can even, you know, think about it clearly. And so, yeah, I mean, in that sense, you are reclaiming, I think, the fullness of, of human thought and emotion around a particular topic. And I find, like, that's what I'm reclaiming. Because my earliest drafts on things are like the, you know, a clownishly caricatured parody of what I'm trying to say, or they're a clownish pa parody of brutality. Like it's too angry or it's too compassionate and that can't be, you know, a, the human response. So, you know, it, it, it's giving to yourself as an yeah. act of thinking on the page or feeling on the page. Um, and in that sense, it does feel very much like you're reclaiming all the messy parts of something, yep. and it should be that messy, and it should be complicated, whether it starts in anger or you know, yeah. happiness or what have you. Yeah. I, I want to sort of jump into about the, the idea of, of what women in particular notice. Mm. Um, it's a bit of a direct digression from the writing bit, but um, if I can mention, like, I've, I've been asked to... <laughs> I've been, I've been asked to speak at a spirituality in the pub thing, and they asked me what I wanted to talk about, and I said, oh, can I talk about pesky Catholic women? Because like, <laughs> cause there's, been, there's been a process of, of erasure, really. And there's a, I want to talk about a couple of things quickly, if I can, that, that, that capture that idea of, of women being erased as well, and, and women it, redeeming those, those spaces, like unerasing. <laughs> or reinstituting those things that had been erased, usually by patriarchal mm. structures or attitudes. Um, so like a couple of things. Oh, so so, so the, there's, a thing, there's a thing that um, in early Christian communities, there were actually women, women deacons and women bishops, right? Um, but that, that, has, that has been literally buried. Like it wasn't until around the 1980s that um, someone actually discovered frescoes in one of the catacombs in Rome that had images of women dressed like bishops and, and you know, 
holding liturgies in, in the Eucharist and stuff. And it was a woman theologian who discovered that. And, and she said, oh, she noticed one you know, image where it looked like a beard had been tacked on <laughs> from the original <laughs> to make it look like it was actually a man rather than a woman. So literally erasing. And then, and then a woman, you know, for a few hundred years, century, a, a few centuries down going, oh, yeah, actually, these are images of women, you know? So the other instance, um, just very quickly, and I didn't even know this until recently, I spoke to a uh, United Church minister and theologian who said that actually the early church communities referred to Jesus as in feminine terms. So, um, so the character of, of, of wisdom in ancient um, texts, like in Hebrew texts and Hebrew traditions, is actually personified as a woman. And so in the early church communities, when when people referred to Jesus as, as wisdom, they were actually referencing a female character. So, and that got buried. You know, we don't think about that. And, and, and it wasn't until um, this um, United Church minister, her name's Sally Douglas, said, actually, if you think about it, the stuff that Jesus did was women's work. I didn't even think of it as like, in those times, it would have been women's work, like feeding people and washing feet and weeping and, you know, like, they're, like Right, like they're, they're, they're women's work, they're, they're, they're regarded as, as feminized, mm. you know, um, behavior. But it's kind of sort of been sublimated. And so, and so it took women to sort of, so these, these aspects were erased deliberately or unintentionally, who knows? Maybe, probably deliberately. Um, and it, it, took, it took women to reinstate um, those understandings and, and, and sort of broadening the vocabulary that we have. You know, I think that's sort of basically why it's so important to have um, women's writing, not just to talk about women's experiences, but all spheres of life in which we exist. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. <laughs> um, and uh, by the way, the essay that Fatima talked about um, in relation to Filipino women being not at all the cardboard cutouts, but these incredible powerhouses, revolutionary dissenters, prophets, yes. uh, uh, tribal chiefs and, and so forth is called the, hist uh, the Secret History of Filipino Women. Yes. And I am no longer being um, older than I would like to be. I'm no longer astonished. One of the things that happened for me is that I'm no longer <coughs> astonished by the depths of my ignorance. But uh, that essay was a revelation. And at, at the same time, it's not being a revelation because, well, of course, women were all yes. those things. And of course, I know that in every society, yes. they were the makers of that society. And yet, you know, particularly in relation to Filipino women, uh, those caricatures that you talk about, Fatima, yeah. are so prevalent uh, in the Western kind of imaginary where you go, wow. You know, so just a kind of essential reading, really. Um, you talked about drafts. Uh, Sarah, just uh, uh, a question, a personal question, uh, just between me, me and you. How many drafts did you go through for this book? <laughs> One. Really? <laughs> um, uh, like I think it was uh, like probably six or seven. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm. And what was the biggest difference between the first draft and the final draft? Was it that kind of too much, too compassionate, too overwrought, yeah, or was, was there something else? Yeah, the earlier drafts were too much of a hagiography, hey which was yeah. one journey towards resilience, which mm. I think there's enough books of uh, mm. inspiration porn. Yeah. Um, and for two, not that your book is in this, but I like, used the word, the, yeah, the, yeah. Use the phrase, it was not, porn earlier. Yeah. not like, too late, Sarah, happy. I think they just, no, please. Oh, we've lost that one. If, if yeah. this is the inspiration, when this one, then. Yeah, we're in trouble. Um, so, where were they? Yeah, for, for two reasons, I was deeply uncomfortable with that. First, um, it, it does nothing to honor Sandra's humanity, if that's the larger point that I'm trying to make, if I present a, a version that's, um, you know, ca smooth to the point of caricature, that does, um, you know, an opposite violence, um, I, I believe, in terms of, you know, being able to share and tell a truthful story. Um, and the second thing is that, you know, in the earlier iterations of, of the story, these disconnects and disjuncts between, you know, Sometimes it was just the problem of physically um, or temporally getting from A to B. When we had a gap of about five or ten years, it just, you know, that was, it couldn't be true. So things that 
um, you know, she had honestly remembered w weren't working and things that, you know, she probably massaged into realms of fact weren't mm. working. And, you know, there were a number of people that had been in her life earlier on um, who were generous enough to sit down and share their side of the story. And there was no way of smoothing them into this neat, um, mm. clean, happy tale. And it was very annoying. Um, because they kept on curling up and curling up and the smoothing down and it was mm -hmm. like screwing with the story until yeah. I realized that was the story. Yeah. And so this is the other thing about creative work and versus academic work that I found is that, um, like at least it's true of law, you know, it's, very, it's a very clean process after, you know, the terror of doing all your work and your footnoting. The creative stuff, it's, Every time I try, like it's like the material is going to tell you what it is, mm. and again, it's very wanky, I find. But it's like you cannot superimpose yeah. upon it, and God help you if at the at the end of a four-year project, you've written up neatly what you set out to do. You probably didn't do your work properly, and you don't need a PhD to have realized that topics change over time for a reason. So. Um, when I could stop being frustrated about those disjuncts and more curious as to what they were telling me, then I really feel like the story yeah. started to get somewhere. Mm. And I actually feel like it's one of the um, real achievements uh, of this book, the way you handle the fact that, you know, that, uh, you know, there are, as, you know, you've, you've spoken about it, so huge chunks are forgotten or misremembered. Some of it is, uh, uh, perhaps some of it is Semi willful, maybe a lot of it. Uh, a lot of it is not. There is fabulation, uh, self narration, all, all sorts of things. And I think the way you do it, uh, you kind of make space for Sandra to speak for herself, fully, without you kind of saying, eh, Sandra, that really couldn't have happened. Doesn't add up. It didn't happen to you when you were seven. It happened to you when you were thirteen. Whatever. And then you come in and you speak about all those things that don't add up, but in a way that doesn't take away from you know, her speaking for herself in this way that may be factually incorrect, but nonetheless is the story that she carries yes. within, within herself. So you kind of, you just, you do this double act and there is no kind of um, undermining, you know, you're not undermining, so you're not the kind of clean researcher who comes in and says, well, the facts yes. point to, you know, so I, I think it's actually a really remarkable achievement, and I can't think of many books of uh, Australian nonfiction, and I'm claiming you as one of our writers now that you won all these awards. Yes, yes, definitely. So Australia. you belong to us, Sarah, uh, whatever, <laughs> however much time you spend in New York. God, I'm not in care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so I actually can't think of many books that are able to do that uh, so incredibly well. Uh, you know that this stuff going on, and, and also, you know, there are moments when you are like, you're angry and you're like, you are just choosing to forget. Yep. You are just, you are playing with yourself, or you're playing with me or you're playing with something because clearly you can't forget your children or you can't forget whether you were at their birth or not or whatever, you know, what's going on here. But you do it in a way that never kind of takes away from her uh, speaking for herself um, through your book. Um, and one of the things that I also think is like this kind of incredible achievement, and I, and I think it feeds into many conversations we could have with you uh, if you're interested, uh, or we can impose those conversations on you <laughs> while it's still our time, uh, is um, around how you handle the question of trauma. And I think if we think about Juno Diaz and how trauma can be used as a shield, and we don't have to go there, but that's just a, a thought perhaps that I can just put out there. So you never kind of do the whole, uh, everything is explained by Sandra's trauma. Like her, you know, what's happening with her memory, her kind of self-narration, everything is to do, and Sandra has incredible ongoing trauma and many different kinds of trauma. And she, she has been through kind of incredible things from uh, being uh, neglected and abused as a child right through to being raped, right through to just uh, absolutely kind of um, incomprehensibly violent and terrible things. But at the same time, you don't use trauma as the kind of the answer to all the questions that you have uh, yourself as a writer, which I think is so important. And you kind of make space for things other than trauma. Right. So, for instance, like the society yeah. that, you know, uh, basically in the, you know, at the period of time when Sandra um, uh, kind of realized that um, the body that was assigned to her at birth was not the body that she could ever live in, 
uh, you know, the, the kind of society that uh, made her life so kind of incredibly difficult and made her two career options, whether she danced and sang or she did uh, sex work, right? So, so trauma is not kind of the smoke screen for whatever is happening uh, in, in, in terms of the, you know, the social forces that are really pushing on Sandra and really kind of, you know, sometimes pushing her into corners where she makes choices and, you know, she's like incredible. Yeah. You know, she does sex work in a way that's just, you know, you know, she's, she is unlike anyone else. But nonetheless, all those forces, all the ugliness and brutality of the world around her, the cops and the way they treat, uh, you know, trans people, uh, the silent majority that allows all that shit to go down, the way that she, her birth certificate is, you know, what happens yeah. with the certificate, I don't want to preempt uh, too much. So I'm really interested, sorry, that's a very, very, very long question, which is almost <laughs> like an oration. That's great, I was uh, <laughs> like, But there is method to my madness, Sarah. Um, so I'm just kind of interested in how you thought about, you know, uh, the place, the place of trauma uh, in Sandra's life, and how you kind of thought about because you did a great deal of research and you have these acknowledgments, and you just went to the ends of the earth to understand the social realities that she kind of encountered. Well, it's like, thank you for understanding uh, uh, and uh, my oration <laughs> and for your oration. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's a tightrope, and you know you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. But I think like if you could boil it down into this kind of the Judy's involved in uh, having custodianship, if you want to think about that, of, a, of someone else's story. I mean, first and foremost, you have a duty of amplification. And so you have to take at face value how the subject is claiming um, you know, their own narrative. And that's important. It might not be factually true. It might conflict for a number of reasons, but it is valuable and um, important for numerous reasons. So you have to do justice to that. Um, but you have an equal and sometimes opposite duty to your readers to, you know, this is nonfiction. You have to um, tell your stories accurately um, and honestly as possible. And I, I don't know so much about the role of objectivity in doing that. I mean, I think that, you know, we are, at the end of the day, our only subjectivities and perhaps it's more fertile ground uh, at the end of the day to try to seek through an uh, empathetic imagination what the lived experience, if not the factual experience, might have been in the meaning of that. I went to a Jew Jewish school through year 12, and my old people in my community were all Holocaust survivors. So I had the experience of growing up only knowing trauma, traumatized individuals and seeing the effects of intergenerational trauma in my own family and all of the families of my friends until I was 18. So I had that subjectivity when it comes into what, what does it mean to be a survivor of trauma? What are the various types of traumas? How does this manifest? And I could make observations about, well, usually these are traits, but not always because people are different and it manifests differently. And so if something confounded me in that way, I would try to find the other source for it, whether it comes down to personality traits, whether it comes down to other sources of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, you know, These are not all equal things that can be compared. But in terms of the lived experience, I think they're very similar over time. So you know, knowing when to go to those historical records and when to just rely on your own kind of <coughs> ability to connect and to try to seek out in your own life or your own experience the felt, or the, li the lived experience of shame or self-hatred or uh, terror, mm -hmm. um, and then say, well, if I was immersed in that, what would happen next? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. All the while being honest with your reader about what you're doing. You don't get a clinical, um, you know, verified footnoted uh, work, but you get something that might reach close or aspire to reach an artistic truth that is as true in its own way at the end of the day, hopefully, or not. Uh, or not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's all in my stories. Or not. Um, uh, we're getting signals. <laughs> there are signals, yes. yes. Thank, you. Um, thank you so much for the discussion. That was, that was fabulous, and I have so many questions to ask you. I'll just confine it to one. How about this? Something like, um, in, in the documentary of her life, in The Center Will Not Hold, um, her nephew, Griffin Dunn, asked, asked her a question. 
about um, and about her visit to um, um, basically she visited Haight Ashbury, I think, and then she wrote an essay from it called Slouching Towards Bethlehem. And she walked into the room and she saw a five year old child ingesting acid. The parents were out of it. And and Didion is a sparrow of a woman. She was just a small person. And she was quiet for just a millisecond. And then she brightened up and said, it was gold. Now, you all have, you're all faced with it was gold moments, I'm mm. sure, when you're mm. reading the subjects, whether it be Vera, Sandra, what you commissioned, and so on. Are there areas that you kind of go, this is gold, but I'm not touching it? Do you have those arguments with yourself? Shall I go first? Um, I, I watched that documentary um, and I kind of didn't believe her. I reckon it's a little bit of a narrative. I don't think, um, I mean, I, I'm a great admirer of John Didion's work uh, and I read that essay um, and I just, the, the kind of mercenary uh, impulse that she describes without any qualifications, um, I actually don't quite believe it. I think, I think it's a good story. Uh, like the story that, you know, um, if you are in a family who's got a writer, well, then, you know, it's too late for you or whatever. It's like, <laughs> right. uh, oh, yeah. um, I, I just, I, I don't believe it. Um, um, I, I think Joan Dillon is a highly ethical writer and the person who she does things to is usually herself, where she just kind of goes beyond where perhaps the closed door might be. Uh, for me, um, if... Uh, relationships, um, human beings, and this is not because I'm such a moral giant, I am a dwarf in very many ways, but I, I just wouldn't touch things that uh, kind of, that can injure people. So I think to write about a child who is um, addicted to drugs uh, at the age of five due um, directly to that child's parents' behavior, I think is to um, injure terribly that child forever and ever um, and that uh, particular family, um, and there are ways of writing about it. So you can write about five-year-olds crawling through bedrooms, um, you know, in San Francisco uh, without pinning it on a particular human or on a particular family. So you can go to all the shit and you can get in there and you can, and you can be the kind of witness um, who doesn't look away but you, have to, you don't have to pin it on people, you don't have to name people, you don't have to bring this kind of additional layer of shame. You mentioned um, shame. Um, so, no, I, you know, and, and I think that writers, and I think because uh, w women writers of nonfiction are pushing against all sorts of things, I think she is overstating the case for the kind of things that we are prepared to do as writers of nonfiction. And there is a reason for why she's doing it, but I don't buy it. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I feel similarly. Um, in this book, there is lots of gold, gold. that did not make yeah. it in for yeah. ethical reasons. Um, and here it all is. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question like us. that. So, like, so what didn't make it in? Yeah. Um, it, but yeah, I, um, with the jobs, chose to err on the side of de-identification and name changes, uh, even where they were more than happy to have their names in because of those particular vulnerabilities. Um, there were people who said they were fine with me being there, but I sensed that they weren't. I left immediately. Um, you know, for me, I don't want to be there. And, you know, you, and, you know there's a choice, and uh, at the end, everything's easy in retrospect, but do you go, and I don't believe being there and seeing it and not writing about it for me in those circumstances met the duty sufficiently because it's all knowledge, it all goes into part of the iceberg and I just thought this wasn't, you know, this wasn't for me now. There were people, you know, her children, I, that was their story, I deliberately did not want any of that in there. Um, but yeah, it's a balancing, it seems like it's a keeling ship sometimes because you don't know what the long-term you know, implications of something, but if it doesn't smell right, you know, don't do it. <laughs> Did Sandra ever not want you to write the book? No, she was, you know, and she had to approve the final manuscript. So, um, you know, she was, I think in that case, it was the problems of over enthusiasm rather than mm. under enthusiasm. It okay. can be just as difficult to deal yeah. with and just as dangerous in their implications. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, um, gold. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, it's really hard to answer the question, but I, I, I know, I know, I know only what the parameter, 
parameters are around not running with something. So, like we try to exercise duty of care. It's kind of like, I'm not sure if any of your English teachers, I mean, you know, sometimes, I'm not sure if you're ever, yeah, anyway, sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I turned to you. Because my <laughs> accent, I don't speak English. <laughs> no. um, you know, sometimes, some, because writing being what it is, sometimes people give themselves away. Yeah. Sometimes, e even when they don't realize it. So, you know, we might get submissions and, you know, we do exercise duty of care. We might go, actually, this is, this, this, she's exposing or he is exposing, uh, you know, they're exposing themselves too much. Um, it's probably not right to run with it. Um, so, yeah, that, this, this, that's basically, you know, a very loose outline of a parameter that, that, that we go with. Um, cause, yeah, because in, in the end, there's a person attached to the byline. Absolutely. So, the editor. Well, yeah, the so it's not editor. just. I guess the editor's role. Like exactly, the exactly. Mm -hmm. So even if, if even if you think you know it'll get a huge response, and usually personal stories are the ones that uh, are usually the things that people are drawn to the most. Um, you know, we do we do practice restraint in that regard. There's just thought of it now um, you know with the stories that I'm working on now and with this book I have a personal rule you know have they uh, writing about subjects is not once they consent everything is fair game I feel like if you're gonna write honestly and sometimes honestly to the point of being cutting you have to put something in its place. You can't take away anything without putting something in, in its place. And I feel like that's just a human ethical duty. Um, unless someone is like a public figure, and this is a different kind of writing than I do most of the time, and they're a dangerous idiot, go to town. <laughs> like, yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have questions. Um, so obviously I read a lot of um, memoir and narrative nonfiction. Um, so a lot of those kinds of stories uh, tend to wrap up nice and neatly, um, where we go from, say, negative to positive. Um, so I just wondered what your opinion was on sort of the redemption narrative in memoir and mm -hmm. creative nonfiction, and how do we subvert and escape it? Mm. It's a tricky thing because I think the writing process I mean, I can't speak for, for the other panelists, but sometimes it's a way of, of making sense, especially, yeah, so, so writing for me personally is a, is a way of, of, of making sense. And sometimes in trying to make sense, we end up, um, I think you referred to this, making it, trying to make it neat or compartmentalize or, you know, structure, putting structure to something in order to, to, to be able to grasp it. Um, and I think, I mean, you know, your 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 approach approach is probably closer to um, where you know it's a, a more how do I put this? It, it, you, 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 your approach is probably um, promising in terms of more promising in terms of letting things be what they are, letting people be what they are. It, it is what it is, like kind of letting things. Um, I think, sorry, what I was getting at when I was talking about how writing is, is a way of making sense of things is that sometimes things don't make sense. <laughs> sometimes life is just absurd. And sometimes people die and it's meaningless. And I, I, and I think we have to be able to, to hold that. Um, what, what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about um, Sarah and we talked about inspiration porn and you put it on me and, you know. But I hold <laughs> no grudges. Um, but uh, but I but I think you know there is uh, uh, what I felt, and I, I wonder you know whether that was your experience. I actually felt that you were very conscious of that. Um, sorry, the person who asked the question disappeared. Hello, sorry, want to address address the person? Great text, by the way. But um, that uh, what I felt uh, was an active resistance to the kind of pressures of those forms and templates, the active resistance, um, Sarah, in kind of making um, Sandra, uh, creating that redemptive narrative and against all odds, you know, the story of resistance and even, you know, 
text should have known better. One woman's, you know, the sub <laughs> is subtitle. One woman's, you know, what is it? One extraordinary, woman's woman's extraordinary the word extraordinary also, we can think about that. Um, so I think those pressures in, uh, in kind of trade publishing, uh, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't come from people. I think it comes from the industry maybe, or it's internalized um, as well. Yep. Uh, and I think that the best kind of uh, nonfiction in this country and beyond actively resists uh, because life is absurd, because things don't make sense, because there is some kind of a violence that you do to human life when you try to push it. And we know that stories of addiction, you know, how many relapses. So to end the story, and Leslie Jameson's new book, for instance, deals with that as well. You know, that, you know, what an incredible lie, you know, to end this on, you know, and she never used ever after. She never drank ever after. She never injected ever after. I mean, it's untrue, um, and it's, it, it's an act of violence. So um, there are these kind of templates and forms and ways of telling, particularly women's stories, uh, in, the kind of, in, in, in terms of our industry. Um, and I think we need to push back, and, 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 you know, um, because they, you know, they're insidious. Um, and they take us away from kind of the duties that we take on as, as writers of nonfiction. So, yeah. Also, it's like, what, what does it even mean at the end of the day to have a to be redemptive? I mean, firstly, it's not something anybody can give to anyone else, no matter how much you want to heal them or help them. You will fix. You know, this is what's your name? She wrote the lovely bones, maybe. <coughs> yeah. Uh, Alice, Alice Sebold. Yeah. yeah. You, you save yourself or you stay broken. I'm sure she said it much more eloquently, but it is true. Like, redemption is not for, you know, you can't, you know, farm it out. And also, what does it mean? I mean, you know, sometimes, like, did anyone see that article in the Daily Mail about the 129 year old woman where she, she's in, like, Chechnya, who's like, every day of my life has been a punishment? Um, <laughs> like, so, making it through is not necessarily redemptive. Um, you know, what does it mean? Like, you can have a life cut short in the most horrifying way that was very redemptive. And these are meanings that we make for ourselves. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and the pressure here is, is heavy. In the States, it's deeply heavy what to co-opt what redemptive stuff looks like and is marketed. Um, you know, I was lucky enough here that that wasn't such an issue. But yeah, I definitely feel that. And but I also think States. that uh, publishers don't realize that readers are better than that. And readers mm -hmm. don't like to read those stories anymore. We are over those stories. And yet, the pressure is still there. Yeah. And the kind of the habits, the old habits, yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, come back to the question that I was hoping to get answers to, and which is the, the written in the introduction for the workshop, which is, can writing about women's real lives affect social change? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to specifically ask you two, because in your work, because it's politically yeah. kind of linked as well, I wanted to see how you see your work mm -hmm. in relation to social change, and also um, your experience of whether you see those ripples that your work creates, or in your case, because you're editor, do you see the need for social change and then you find writing to then um, affect that change or something like that, your relationship with that? I'd love to know more about that. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll speak for myself because it might not necessarily be the institutional <laughs> approach, but you know, I don't go out um, writing to, um, you know, foment change. It's usually because something bothers me. And obviously I want to see it changed, and so I write about it. And I think in the writing of it, I, th I think, um, you know, it, it's like, like uh, what, what we do is part of culture, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think it's not, how do I put it? It's, it, it's about increments, and, it, and it's about all these voices coming together and, and it's about um, critical mass and momentum and all that sort of stuff. And I think, I mean, we see that all throughout history, that there are tipping points. And so adding your voice to that, writing about something, even if you'll never be acknowledged, <laughs> you know, um, that, that you're part of that, 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 that mass that, that moved towards the tipping point. I mean, we think, we think about the US um, civil rights era, there's like thousands of people we ne never hear of. Like the, the civil rights era wasn't just 
Martin Luther King Jr. There were women around him. You know, there were white people who were also fighting for civil rights. We don't hear about them. They're not named, but they're there, and they were part of those tipping points. So I think I see myself, I see my, my writing in, in, in that context of, of affirming and validating, um, you know, the things, the things that matter. Um, because otherwise, if you don't occupy that space, <laughs> other people will, you know, with, with a different view. So I think there's a sense as well that you have to contest these things, even, no matter how exhausting and frustrating and exasperating it is, that, <laughs> that you don't let the bastards win, you know? You've got, you got to really contest it. It's, it's, it's about constant vigilance. Um, in terms of um, social change, I think sometimes to... It goes back to what I was saying earlier about people being noticed or people being seen or, or, or just, just the act of, of, of being seen. I remember um, I wrote a, a column for right now about cleaners. Mm. Um, and usually, uh, well, particularly in terms of exploitation in the cleaning industry. And, and most cleaners are actually really, you know, the most vulnerable sections of society. Migrants, migrant women, um, students. Um, so I wrote it, and then it took about a year, but uh, a union officer from United Voice came across the column and went out of his way to write an email saying he was so amazed and so pleased that someone was writing about it because he felt that the people he was fighting for were invisible, that even in the progressive <coughs> space, people don't talk about those, you know, about cleaners. So, so just, just him, and it was really lovely. It made my day. Like, he was like... He was writing about how, you know, reading my um, column really gave him a lift in terms of what he was, you know, working towards. So it's, it's those little things. It's, it's, it's incremental. So yeah. I'm not sure if that goes to your question. No, but does. Yeah. What do you guys think? Um, I, just, I was just thinking that when you notice other writers <laughs> and when you tap them on the shoulder and give them a chance to write, that to me is like... A, that's a huge part of change when you, you know, and when these people all of a sudden think of themselves as writers and think of what they've got to say as in need of being said and in yeah. need of being heard, that to me is, you know, that's, that's change. That's, you know, yeah. that's one of the most meaningful things out there in, in that way. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's important to, to us to validate, you know, so much, so much in society is about invalidating and, and racing, and we kind of sort of try to do what we can to undo that. Um, but yeah. Any, are there any further questions? Hi, so I have like two questions, one more broadly and one more specifically to you, Fatima. So I'm a University of Melbourne student um, and I'm actually currently a columnist at our magazine called Farago. And I was just wondering if you have any advice you would like to give to an aspiring writer, if you will, um, and also more directly to you, Fatima, about how to be a woman of colour existing in, um, in writers, writing spaces, if you will, that sort of seek to to sugarcoat what you have to say in order for mass consumption and your, um, your struggle, your, your path on that. Do you want to start? Um, there's no universal way of being a woman, <laughs> much less a woman of color. So I think, you know, you speak to your, to your experience and from your experience and certainly, you know, you, your, voice, your voice is yours. I'm not really sure. Um, in terms of you know being a woman of color, I think the first thing is to have um, supportive people around you because it is difficult uh, personally and professionally. So you got to have um, people around you that are going to have um, your back, even just to vent because you know there's like there are microaggressions that you are, you deal with and stuff like that. Um, in terms of whether you know the um, pressure to tone down what I have to say. I not experienced that, or if someone has been trying to get me to tone it down, I've completely ignored them or missed them. So, um, yeah, I think, I mean, it boils down to integrity, doesn't it? Like, you gotta, you got, you gotta write with integrity, because um, at the end of the day, it, what you put out has your name attached to it, and you gotta speak your truth as well. Um, 
And, uh, and yeah, and, and, us, and truth lasts is the thing. I, I think, yeah, and people in power don't get that. They think that if they can wear you down long enough, like people in power, like, I don't know, white editors or white publishers or white politicians or whatever, you know, sometimes you know, there's a sense that if they can just wear you down, that you will eventually go away. Um, but the truth lasts, and, and your truth will last longer. Um, so I think you gotta, yeah, you gotta, you gotta stand by that. It's not. I feel like I'm like putting out like bromides and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think. Sorry, maybe I'll throw it to the other women. <laughs> I think like again, this will be platitudinous, but stay with me. Uh -huh. uh, it, like, just don't stop because it takes a very long time sometimes, and it's none of that is wasted time because again, platitudinous. All your experiences will benefit your writing, but it's more. It's thinking around what that actually means. So when you catch yourself now, you know, if you do on social media or you know when you're reading lit mags or journals or books or whatever, thinking, oh, that should have been me, or I wish I had done that. Spend no energy, uh, no time with those thoughts. Use that time to tune out and follow what you're actually interested in, and just build yourself up so much from the inside that it will come out in your writing. And that might be next week, and it might be 20 years. You know, I wrote without success for nearly 25 years. So, Hang just on, how old are you? I'm 100,000 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 38. Started early. I'm 38. Um, so, you know, you just keep it. And, uh, you know, I would get rejections. I mean, that was just the, since uni. I mean, that was just every, uh, keep on submitting, get rejections. And you can let it affect you zero. You just use any of that energy, that emotional energy, you catch yourself and you bring yourself back to your work. And if you do that for long enough, you will get it out there because there's a million confident assholes who are doing it and who will get it out there just because they say they're great. Um, so you, and, you know, it's easy to say, but you know, hold it as long as you can. And you only need to find one other person who's like confirms that you're not like a psychopathic narcissist um, <laughs> and that what you're doing is worthy and you should keep doing it. You just need one other person to validate that and you know, don't listen to anything else, even if it's yourself. Can I also say, just cut in, seek mentors, because they are there yeah. and they are out there. And I, I believe in the power of indignation, actually, I'm sorry. A lot of my work and my writing and what I do is actually fueled by indignation. I channel, I'm not nice like you, basically, I'm just grumpy. So <laughs> I use that energy, I use that indignation and that urge to burn this down or want to change the world, whatever it might be, to actually put it into my work and to always keep trying. But I think seeking mentors, they are always women around, people around who can help, who have experience, who can actually help open doors. I mean, my, my life, I think, has been filled with them and I feel very grateful, but they are there. You just have to look for them and I think to ask, mm. but not be afraid to ask. I know that sounds very, very inspiration pony, but really, like a tum <laughs> <laughs> Tumblr feed, but really, it, it is, it really does. They do, they do exist out there, but don't give up, I think, and keep writing. Like I still have this file. My dad made it when I was in grade nine, and it says Sarah's writing, and it was everything that I thought was great. And I'd show him. I didn't realize that he was doing this, and he was keeping it. And so, you know, you just need that one, whoever is your mentor, and you need just one other person, and that's it. And sometimes you don't even need them. You just keep on doing it. Um, and I would just add, first of all, who said we were nice? <laughs> <laughs> Second of all. Um, I would just say that um, another, I'm adding to platitudes, uh, to the mountain of platitudes. Uh, so my platitude is that courage is not being unafraid, courage is being afraid and doing it nonetheless. That's, that's my, that goes on my t-shirt. <laughs> Any other questions? We probably have time for one last question. <coughs> You can do it. Come on. <laughs> Hi. I'm interested in historical erasures and going back and filling out women who have been written out of history. <coughs> and um, I'm interested in that and I'm interested in the notion of the gaps 
um, and particularly Sarah was talking about leaving the gaps there. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about those two, two things side by side, respecting the gaps, redeeming the <coughs> historical erasures. Mm. Um, I, I would just say um, that um, I think in the best non-fiction, and I'm not responding to the first part of your question because I, I just feel the urge to say something about the second part, and I know you are asking us to think about them at the same time, but uh, in the best kind of non-fiction, I feel that gaps are not hidden, they're not covered up, they're not smoothed out, that in fact you write with the gaps and through the <coughs> gaps. The gaps are our friends, yeah. uh, not, not something to be kind of, you know, to fight with um, as well. So that, that feels to me um, really, really important. I, I don't have anything profound to say about uh, history, other than, yes, of course, you know, one of the primary tasks of, you know, and we all uh, believe deeply in research. We <laughs> talked about context. Sarah talked about projects that uh, take a long time and the importance of kind of doing those projects that cannot be done in, in, two, in two months. Uh, Sarah's book took four years, mine took nine, so I win, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, I, uh, but I don't have anything interesting to say about uh, the work of um, going into kind of excavation and, and reclamation of women whose historical experiences have been erased other than it's an essential work, absolutely, but. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I think that the, the, just the only thing I could possibly add is the, the gaps aren't the problem. I think that it, it, they're fantastic because they're so clearly themselves and there's so much that can be done or not, but they're at least honest with themselves. The, the gaps that you don't see are the ones that have been papered over and presented as truth and take much more um, time and energy and insight to interrogate because they <laughs> present themselves as having been neatly resolved when we know really nothing ever is neatly resolved. So at least with the gaps, we're calling things what they are and we can actually begin the work. And maybe that doesn't get you anywhere. Um, and I, the only <coughs> advice with that, I mean, I. I don't see things in landscape terms at all. I have very bad um, bird's eye <coughs> view. I can only see the details. And I couldn't connect them together in a you know, monolithic way to tell you what they mean because I can only <coughs> see the exceptions, which does not serve me well um, in my legal work because you know, that's the so what of why you do all that work. But with this stuff, I mean, I think that if you uh, worry less about what it's all saying in terms of a narrative conclusion and just get lost in the actual story, which is only in its small particulars, um, a lot of the work kind of fe feel, will feel like it's being done in that act of noticing. And also, you know, the gaps are, are wonderful. I just finished earlier this year, Mary Oliver, who's my, one of my favorite poets, her collection of essays, and she, you know, all writing rests in the power of suggestion. So even if you were to write a complete thing, you would only hope in making a relationship with your reader that relies on your ability to spark something in their mind. And you know, that's like the best writing is like the best teaching and that, that kind of subliminal communication. So you know, if we can suggest what the gaps might mean or be curious about what they might have to say, that, that too is doing the work, so. There. Um. I think, I think there's a very, um, there's a distinctly structural um, <coughs> sort of remedy for erasure, which is to actually um, put people who have been historically <laughs> erased into positions of, of power and influence. Um, so like having women editors or, or having um, indigenous um, or brown, brown, black, um, editors, publishers um, that are making the uh, that are in a, in a position to um, put forward material, you know, from things that they have noticed. Because I really want to emphasize this that it takes a certain person sometimes to notice things. Like I said before, like it took a woman theologian slash archaeologist to notice that the women in the uh, the figures in the catacombs were women. It took a woman theologian to figure out that wisdom in reference to Jesus was actually about the female personification of, of wisdom. Um, so I think it, it takes people, uh, so it, 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 it takes um, 
it, th there's a structural remedy, which is to put people in place who would be more likely to notice those gaps. Um, but also, it's not just gaps or erasure. It's the it's the taming. It's the mini, mini, minimization of, of the figures, even those historical figures that are well known. So, for example, like in Catholic context, um, you know, Mary MacKillop, who is Australia's first saint, you know, yada yada yada. She's like this holy figure, but in her lifetime, she was in huge trouble with the Archbishop. She had she had a huge huge clash. She was a troublemaker. But the troublemaker part we don't hear about, we just know she's saintly. The same thing happened to Dorothy Day, you know, she's held up as like the quintessential um, Catholic activist um, in the US, but again, she got in huge trouble with the Archbishop and did her things her own way. It's not just women too, like if you think about Martin Luther King Jr., he's been tamed as well, you know, as a peaceful activist, <laughs> despite the fact that everything he did was about disrupting the system and getting the state to react to, to what they were doing and what they were fighting for. So, so it's not just, just erasure and the gaps, it's also being mindful of, of what's being tamed, for what purpose, and who benefits from that. Because um, obviously, you know, this, usually these things are about what constitutes as a threat um, to the status quo and to the patriarchy, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Lena Kuo might say that's where the light gets in, with the cracks, basically. Mm -hmm. And in answer to your question, too, just quickly, um, I think there, there's work by um, Claire, Claire Wright, for instance, who did a work on um, the Eureka women, the women at the Eureka Stockade. Um, wow. There's work, um, there's a recent biography of, um, I think, Eileen Kelly, Eileen or Ellen Kelly, which, who's, of course, famous for being um, Ned Kelly's mother. So there are works that are happening. They just may not get the same prominence, um, unfortunately. But I think Claire Wright's book is a very nice um, exemplar of, of the kind of rewriting of history to reinsert women into the discourse. Well, thank you so much for the session, speakers. Can you please join me in thanking Maria, Sarah, and Fatima? <laughs> And can I also ask that you thank our volunteers who've been wonderful. We'd also like to extend our thanks to our venue partner, the Queen Victoria Women's Centre, who have been fabulous in providing us with this space, and also to the Victorian Government for funding. Um, we have book sales and signings happening downstairs, and you can get um, Maria, Sarah, to write um, nice messages in your books. <laughs> um, Fatima can probably sign, you know. Um, follow me on Twitter. That's right, follow her on Twitter. That's Subscribe right. Subscribe to my podcast. And please, um, let's continue the conversation on social media. You can follow our hashtag FWF18 um, on Twitter. Can I just ask Nico just to read their face for a moment? Yeah. We're just going to let the audience yes. get out because they've got to get, they got to go down. And down. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. We're the art in front. Well, it's like that moves you're wondering. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Thank you.